You're live. Hey guys, Chris, you know, natural progressive. So Deanna Meyer is back, um, an incredible environmental activist and um, just an amazing gal, a good friend of um, Derek Jensen. So that's kind of cool. But we're just going to, we're pretty much going to just have a conversation. This is not going to be super formal. Uh, just want to catch up with her doings, her goings on right now um, and see what projects, I guess there's a, a thing going on with black ferrets and, and, and it has something to do with the prairie dogs and there's some kind of mess there. And I really want to find out, uh, I heard the whole story, but it was a while back. So I'm a little foggy on it. So forgive me, um, please say hello, Deanna. Awesome. So what is going on? What's the deal with the, the black ferrets? And then we're going to get into the biodiversity um, loss with the UN report and, and, and just kind of vent about that. That sounds good. <laughs> I just did an interview with Derek about black footed ferrets because he had seen something that I had written about it on uh, social media. But basically, we were just talking about the whole fact that a lot of people and the Fish and Wildlife Service will always talk about, you know, the loss of the black-footed ferrets and how terrible that is, but they never mention the real problem and the real issue with black-footed ferrets, which is prairie dogs. They mention it, but prairie dogs are always a side dish. So we were just kind of exploring the idea that there's this program that's funded because black-footed ferrets are one of the most critically endangered mammals in North America, or they are the critically most endangered mammal in North America on the ESA. And so there's a program to try to get them to come back and to not be endangered anymore. And it's a huge failure and it always has been. And the main reason it's a failure is because you need between 10 and 20,000 acres of, of prairie dogs and not sparsely populated, you know, densely populated prairie dogs in order to sustain a ferret family of 30. Um, or, or uh, the number of 30 ferrets. So, you know, it takes 30 ferrets, about 20,000 acres of prairie dogs to live, you know, and one ferret eats between one and 200 prairie dogs every year. So the issue behind it all is just kind of like the prairie dogs always get the, you know, they, they always get treated pretty poorly as a nuisance species. And- So the, the ferrets actually, wait, they eat the prairie dogs? They do. They depend. They're ninety nine percent dependent upon prairie dogs. They live in their burrows and they also eat the prairie dogs for their diet. So when they did a mass poisoning campaign uh, against the prairie dogs to kill all of them, and they continue to do that campaign, then it destroys the ability for the black footed ferret to live. So the black footed ferret cannot live without the prairie dog and neither can burrowing owls. And so there's a couple of species who are in trouble precisely because prairie dogs have been targeted for mass destruction. And of course, in doing that, we've destroyed our grasslands and we've destroyed the species that the grasslands need to um, create a healthy planet. Yeah, well, the grasslands are just perfect for humans to develop houses on, right? And to grow crops. Right. So a lot of them, especially in the 1800s and, you know, 19, 1900s, until we started doing massive development for the, with these suburban homes was a lot of it was definitely for agriculture and still is. Right. That's just devastating. I mean, I think you need both the predators and the prey to, to keep a, an equal balance and, and humans have definitely butted their nose into um, the whole entire balance of nature and mess the whole thing up and then whenever they try to fix it they end up making it worse and you know I, there's example after example you know trying to control the wolf population and and most of it's in the name of, of ranchers and farmers and, and all that not actually in the name of conservation don't you think oh yeah conservation's been used just recently i was working on a petition to try to ban the hunting and trapping of bobcats in Colorado. And I did that a lot to highlight how the system, how the system itself needs to be dismantled. And so Colorado Parks and Wildlife oversees the, the bobcats, the hunting, the prairie dogs, and they're really an instrument to protect these 
people like the trapping and the hunting community who are doing, you know, I, I hunt for food too, but the trap, the trapping community that hunts for recreation and commercial purposes, like just for the fur is what the bobcats are for. Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the system really promotes them. And then they twist it and call it conservation. So they say, we have to manage these animals and manage means kill. So we have mm-hmm. to manage prairie dogs by poison. We have to manage coyotes. We have to manage predators, which is the furthest from the truth ever because apex predators are self-regulating. So they don't overpopulate. Um, they, they breed according to what they can, what the land can sustain. Right. What food is available. If there's no food available, their populations naturally decrease until there is food available and then they naturally increase. And God, if only people were like that. I mean, I guess they kind of are because when um, food increased, when they when they were able to mass produce food, more people were born, right? Um, right. Agriculture is really, the, and, and we're an overshoot. I mean, that's our yeah. problem right now is that we have overshot the carrying capacity of the planet. That's the under, and that the underlying reason why is because of agriculture. And of course, because humans can believe in stories. I mean, that's that, you know, that, that we can believe that we have domination over all of the animals on this planet is definitely a nail in our coffin for sure, because we're destroying the ability for ourselves and for all the other non-humans on the planet to survive as well. Right. Yeah. Um, I see that's, that's the thing. I mean, this is why I wanted to take you back on because you and I think so much alike that way. <coughs> humans, really think that they are above and beyond all of nature and and they're they're above it they're not a part of it and and that is to our own destruction and that's also to the destruction of every other living being on the planet all the other animals we're just destroying them left and right because we think we can live without them when we absolutely cannot we need to keep that balance and i i'm so grateful to people like you that that fight your heart out for for these creatures no matter how small they are um the prairie dogs are so adorable and and they're amazing little culture and and they're really similar to the utah um ground squirrel they call them pot guts here which i think is a horrible name for such a wonderful little creature um the other name for them is target practice and it's it's just disgusting what they what they do to those little critters. I, I actually um, was able, about a month ago, I was traveling up through the area where I grew up and stopped at the rest stop up there. And there's little trails where you can take a hike. And, and I usually do that when I travel a lot because I like to get moving. I hate just driving. And I was walking up the trail and there was all these adorable little Utah ground squirrels and they look a lot like prairie dogs. I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference if they were side by side. I don't know. They're, they're adorable as hell and very smart. They were following me up the trail. I'm like, dang, I wish I had something to feed you. (laughs) They were so freaking cute, but dang, I mean, even those little creatures are so important. And, and I just want you to reiterate the importance they do have in our environment, not only as a food source for other animals, but, but the other important aspects, um, the, the things they contribute to, to our ecosystem, um, as far as, you know, what, what happens when they burrow in and with the water and all that, could, could you explain that a little bit again? I know you did that last time, but let's go through that again. Yeah. I'm wondering when you're talking about the pop guts, are you sure that's, that's, is that the Utah prairie dog? Yes. The Utah prairie dog. They're protected there, but um, they're supposed to be, but they they're, still- they're not They're Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And the pop gut, that's just because what the, when they shoot them and they do that, like they have these, the society called the red mist society and mm-hmm. they take high power powered rifles and kill prairie dogs. And they call them red mist because of the blood that, that sprays out of them when they shoot them. So, I mean, people travel to Colorado from numerous other states for the purpose of shooting prairie dogs. And I'm sure that's, that's sad the case anywhere. But yeah, I mean, the, the, we're just, this, this culture's insane. And like Derek said, it has a death urge. And we, mm. uh, by killing the prairie dogs, we're killing ourselves. And with the, like the example of the water that I had given last time, and it's just, it highlights like the inability of this culture and even of our brains as the, uh, human brains to really understand the complexities that are involved 
mm-hmm. in nature and the way that everything connects together and supports us. We're kind of taught like this, the earth is not, is very resilient and that, you know, there's no way we could really harm it. That's, that's what our culture tries to teach people. I know, but it's really not that resilient. It's really a delicate balance. It took millions and millions and millions of years to develop this delicate balance. And in such a short period of time, we are destroying that balance. Yeah. We so, sure okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But I mean, like with the water, so, you know, prairie dogs and like this, there, there were huge colonies all across the plains and the, of Western United States and in, on all the short grass, medium grass and tall grass prairie do- prairies, there was prairie dogs. So, um, and they have these huge burrowing systems and voles do it too. So any burrowing uh, rodent or, or animal when they dig into the ground, they're aerating the soil. So that there was a saying for prairie dogs when uh, the the Hopi said, and the Navajo, I believe too, would tell the Europeans, if you kill all the prairie dogs, there will be no more rain. And, you know, they killed all the prairie dogs and you got the dust bowl. And, you know, the the truth to that was really with a permaculturist went and looked at that and he found that these burrows and when he did the research, actually created uh, the water tables to rise and fall with the tides of the moon, um, which would create condensation much like the rainforest. And on top of that, with all those holes all over the land with all these amazing animals who do this in very important architectural work, uh, when it rains, when it snows, anytime you get moisture, you've got the water running into the holes and down into the groundwater, into the water table. Um, now they're all plugged up in over 90, you know, 8%, 95 to 98% of prairie lands have been destroyed through agriculture. Right. They don't have these holes anymore. So what you get is the rain comes in, it runs off, you know, it runs off into the creeks or the rivers and it gets sucked up and sprayed back out onto the crops. So you don't see the Colorado river reaching the ocean and many rivers do not eat, reach the ocean anymore. Because yeah. Stolen. So you between can- that and damming them all up and yeah stopping the flows and then it ruins all the ecosystems below them and above them definitely so for recharge and we're the this culture's building like you know a cancer metastatic cancer all over the land and you're by by destroying the ability for the water tables to recharge through many different measures but a lot through what these burrowing animals did you're really sealing in the fate of of all species and yeah I mean, on top of many, many other things, it's just one myopic like piece, but we, we don't, prairie dogs create a huge service for multiple species, including ourselves and for the climate and for the planet. And, you know, they've been there for millions and millions of years and have been able to exist in a very functional way uh, for a reason, you know, and, and many up to 180 other species are dependent upon them or more. For survival and those are the you know different mammals then you've got invertebrates just all different kinds of animals totally depend on the prairie dog they're a keystone species they go and the dominoes fall yeah and there's many of those keystone species are are really threatened right now um you of course you know the 109 countries got together in the un and and came up with a biodiversity report i don't remember the exact name but it was a pretty big deal that the media covered for exactly 15 minutes and a million species are going to be going extinct within like three decades and and then the chips are just going to keep falling after that right domino effect yeah it's, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty scary. I, I look at it like right now, I think that we're kind of like a train on a track and we're going about 3000 miles an hour. And we are now able to see the impenetrable concrete wall. And um, we're not slowing down. We're actually pushing down on the accelerator. So mm-hmm. I, I think that's the point in time where we are in history to where all these cards are going to start falling and the dominoes are moving and the cliff is right. We've all, we've just stepped off of the cliff and we're falling down and we just continue to do the same, same old thing. I mean, I just finished reading a book on the lighting and this is bad on Easter Island. And um, let's see, there we go. And trying to get it. So the lighting is not so blinding for everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, those, they killed that, that, 
civilization, like all other ones that end up falling, really destroyed the ability to live on that island anymore. They cut down every last tree. Now you got to think the person who was cutting those trees, I mean, the last person to cut sat there and, and recognized that he was cutting the last tree on the island and he still did it. How do you do that? That's like masochism. It's like, yeah, let's kill ourselves. Uh, but yeah. that's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing right now is we're killing everything both between pollution, overpopulation, overconsumption, and, and just destroying the biosphere and all the mining of the resources um, for everything. I, the things you need for, say, solar panels, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, um, because the Green New Deal, what they want to do is, is put solar panels and wind turbines up and I'm worried about the, the energy and the mining you'd have to do to produce these things. Instead of people just trying to retract and use less energy, they just want to use the exact same amount of energy and, and just make it renewable, renewable energy, which isn't that renewable because you solar panels will have to be replaced eventually. You have to get batteries. You have to extract cobalt and copper from the land i'm still trying to figure out if some people say you can use hemp for solar panels but i'm not entirely sure how that's how that works i haven't found anyone who will talk to me about it yeah. but cement is the is like the fourth largest contributor to the pollution and the problems so how do you build windmills and all that without that and how do you transport those big giant windmills to where where they need to be without using up oil and and fossil fuels how do you how do you build them without fossil fuels i don't know i mean these are the things that that run through my head right. so what what is your I ideal of how do we slow this train down we can't stop it at this point but how do we slow it down i mean for one thing so uh, a book that I just reread was Overshoot by Catton. And he mm -hmm. talks about the whole idea of cargoism or what, you know, and it's this idea that technology can fig fix any of our problems that, you know, as long as we have the solar. So I have solar at my house, I'm off grid. And awesome. it is a joke. I was going to write a book called Solar My Ass, and it was probably going to be like a thousand pages. But I mean, I, oh. I've got to get a couple. Solar is based on batteries. So in order, unless, so when you don't have electricity, you know, you would, you need to depend on the batteries or when it's cloudy, you need to depend on the batteries. Wind is the same way. If you don't have wind, you have to have some type of a battery storage system in order to be able to continue to have electricity during the times that these, the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Um, so, you know, that the metal and the lead and the batteries itself is you have to mine to get those. I mean, to, to run electricity through your house, you need to have copper wires. Copper mm. comes from huge mines. It's right. I live really close to one of the largest, if not the largest copper mine, Kennecott Copper, um, that you can see from space. And I drive by the tailings pile every day when I go to work, which is about three miles long. And, and when it blows, the dust from the tailings just blow right onto the road. And it it gags you. It is so horrible. So yeah. I know what mining copper does. It's not a pretty picture. It's just no. not, not no. a pretty picture. So anyway, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting to me always the links that people will go to try to do the same thing. You know, like the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And mm. the problem is, you know, that we have created a situation in which where we have overshot the carrying capacity of the land and we continue to do it and we continue to grow and we continue to extract. And we think somehow, or I don't, but some people think that somehow if you just extract with a different measure, like sun and whatever, you know, wind or whatever, that, that you can still have your cake and eat it too. Like you can keep going on as long as you can power that system through something that might be a little bit more appreciative or accepted among the environmentalists. And it's a huge flaw and it, it, it puts us in a lot of danger. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of myths with biofuel as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it puts you back into also like, you know, individual choice matters and it doesn't on this scale. I mean, what has to happen if life is going to have any chance is that the sooner this, and people hate hearing this, I hate hearing it, I hate thinking about it, but the sooner this culture ends, 
the sooner the civilization is destroyed, whether it's going to, and it will, it's collapsing. It's going to collapse by its own weight or it's going to collapse because people are going to wake up and help it, which is, you know, I don't see any evidence of that happening yet. The sooner it happens though, the better life is going to be in the long run, that better the earth is going to be able to heal if we keep taking till every little last piece is gone, which is about where we're at, unfortunately. You know, we should have been doing this a long time ago. Um, The harder the fall is going to be and the more serious it's going to be. I mean, the thing is, a hundred years ago, our ancestors didn't have electricity and they lived. And And they lived fine and they were probably a lot happier, but they would live close. They, they, They didn't have to travel 40, 50 miles to work. They, they, they just lived and worked in the same place. A lot of just grew their own food. And, and I think we need to get back to that in order to have any chance of mitigating the damage at all. We need to stop going to work, stay home, grow your own food. And, and, and people just need to, to get ownership of wherever they live. And I don't know what to, but the cities, what do you do with the cities? Because all those people in the cities, they can't do that. They don't have a place to grow food unless they have community gardens or, or something like that. And I'm not sure there's enough, but we have to grow it locally. We can't transport food from out of the country or even out of the state. Um, we're just going to have to live more simply. And it's going to be really, really difficult. And a lot of people aren't going to make it. There's, they're just not going to make it. I think a very, an important thing for everybody to realize too, and this is true. I mean, a couple of things is that a, a very large proportion of the world's population is suffering innumerable uh, insults and, and pain and deaths and, and starvation and genocides at this time in order for us to live the way we do in the city mm-hmm. with the amenities that we have and how we can. Um, so that suffering is clearly there for a lot of people. <laughs> and we're, we're just we're just benefiting from the suffering of those individuals. And a, another thing to, to remember, too, is that, you know, I mean, life my individual life is not as important as a run of salmon and my individual life is not as important as the runs of, of, of as the life in the ocean or as the forest that surrounds me right now or as a colony of prairie dogs and i think that a lot we're so trained to be no, this is a narcissistic culture and and belief it is that. and we're we're kind of trained we are life i mean that those prairie dogs are our kin and those mm-hmm. trees are our kin and those plants are our kin. And I think like I could say a hundred years ago, our ancestors didn't have electricity, but they have the same story that we have today. And that's why we're where we are now. And that's why they were there because they were committing genocide on, on all of life and indigenous people and on the prairies and on the bison and on the, you know, on this continent and on the prairie dogs. So this colonizing mindset was still very much who we are today. In that sense, and the thing that was missing was that people forgot that, you know, the people we should listen to and the people that we should learn from and have reverence for are the living beings in our immediate surrounding on the land. Um, and, and to listen to what, what, what the plants are telling us, like indigenous people have always said has, where they've received their knowledge was from paying attention, paying attention to your surroundings, to the living s- close to it and living off the land. They, yeah. they had to pay yeah. attention and, and respect those beings. Like, I mean, I, I think about the plants, the moss, the lichen, mycelium, those are our oldest ancestors. They've been here a long time and we have a lot to learn from them, but the we guy, <laughs> you know, everything the, that, that's the healer here. You know, that, that if we need, if we want to have faith in somebody, it will be the fungi that we should have faith in, um, mm-hmm. along with, you know, the systems of water. I mean, there's a lot of things, but, but fungi is really a good healer. Um, but, you know, I mean, for us to assume that the land is here and that we're going to have ownership over it and that we're going to be able to do with her what we want is a total, you know, it is our downfall. It's our downfall. And people need to, now I understand, and anybody who's going to be honest, when civilization collapses and it is collapsing and many people on this planet are feeling the effects of that collapse and that climate change and everything. If it, you're not, you will shortly. Yes. And it's not, it's not something any of us individually are, should look for, you know, be like, Oh yeah, I look forward to this civilization seizing its ability to kill every last living being on this planet. 
You know, it's like we're going over the cliff right now, we're falling, and we're grabbing everybody we can to take with us. And I want to see that stop. And I'm not going to be delusional that it's going to be easy or that I'm going to like it when we are the ones feeling the brunt of the collapse. But life on this planet is more important than my lifestyle, than my refrigerator, than my, you know, comfort levels. And, and that's how I feel about that. And whether if anybody feels that way or not, we are going to be feeling, in my opinion, and, and, you know, I am going to end up feeling the consequences of believing that you can have infinite growth on a finite planet and the consequences of believing that relationship with non-humans doesn't mean anything if it's not benefiting us. I, what, what, how do people, I just don't get that. I never have, I've always kind of felt like I've had a, a really strong connection with any animal. It's just, and I kind of grew up, I was lucky because I kind of grew up in like at the foot of a mountain. My backyard was a mountain and, and my idea of a good time was to go hike up into the mountains and, and watch the new streams form when the snow was melting or um, go up and, and catch salamanders in the pond and look at them and play with them and then put them back and, and, you know, watch the birds, watch the mad pies play because they were just, they're just funny birds. They're, they're just hilarious to watch. Um, all of the animals like little snakes and, and just, examine the world around me and and I felt close to it I felt like I was a part of it but you know as as I started to get to know other people that I was so so much of an outcast because they didn't get that you know I'd take them up in the mountains like isn't this cool and they're like I'm bored I want to go home it's like what don't you see all this happening around you don't you hear it don't you hear the birds don't you look, there's a little mouse running there. There's a chipmunk. There's a squirrel. And why didn't anybody get that? I was like, I was such an outcast when I was a kid. I, I, I love, I love the mountain. I loved everything about it. I, I, I much rather spend my time there than, than with people. Yeah. So and I feel the same way. And I think that even, even now, like learning how to listen to the land is really hard and it's extraordinarily important even when I go on walks, which I try to do often, don't, don't do it often enough, but I have to constantly remind myself to shut off the human voice in my head. I mean, I have to constantly be like, pay attention to your yeah. surroundings, listen to the wind, listen to the birds, look at the- yeah, Just be present. Look at the pine needles, yeah. yeah. Look at the rocks, notice what's going on around you, look at the soil. I mean, I still always have to tell myself that, and I've been an outdoor, like you, an outdoor lover for my whole life. I've been in the, you know, I, I try to live as close to the land as I possibly can now, um, but, but I think our culture of insanity, we want to be, we surround ourselves in an echo chamber of humans. So we don't hear the other people who are who are talking to us, who are screaming at us, who are asking us for assistance to help them um, to do something, to care, to give a darn, you know. And when you start paying attention, like you said, I mean, to any of the animals and species that are out there, including the plants and the soil, you start smelling them, taking them in and just having that that moment of silence where you do as much and it's very difficult but where you work as hard as you can to silence the voices and the thoughts in your head and it's hard um that's when you start the that's when you can start hearing the land and start or at least start paying attention and and being absolutely fascinated by the miracle of life that is surrounds us and like you said most people will never get that and they don't want to be around nature and stuff and that's just a symptom of the disease that yeah, uh, it, it's sad it is sad. <laughs> and it, so much is lost in it so much and that that's the social media the addiction i mean civilization and as it gets more and more close to that collapse point or gets bigger and bigger and starts becoming heavier and, and more top heavy on itself every single day, people end up doing the bread and circus thing and the insanity gets more and more so to where they continually shut themselves off from the real world. And they, you know, and we're stuck on the, we're, we're part of the machine. Me too. I'm on the internet a lot. I do a lot of Facebook. I do a lot of social media. I do a lot of work with my organization, a lot of the emails and 
you, you kind of have to. It's like a double-edged sword. It's like catch-22. I mean, you can't just go off into the mountains and do any good, you know, right. but but you need to be out in the mountains to to do yourself good, to, to be a part of it. I mean, I know when I'm in the mountains, no issue not even looking at my phone. I'll stick my phone in the car and not even look at it the whole time I'm I'm gone. I usually I go where there's no phone service anyway, so that makes it easy. And and I and, and I just escape. It's just quiet and and only I get to hear the birds and I get to to watch the little animals and then I get bit by a rattlesnake and <laughs> get rushed to the hospital and then, <laughs> then yeah. I do it all over again. <laughs> it's okay. But, um I, I love the mountains. I can't wait to get back up there. It's been a long, hard winter. So, so sorry. I just got like lost in la la land. Like, oh, oh that's good. I mean, I mean, we all need, we all need that. I mean, in order to, and, and the hardest thing about activism and about trying to save the planet is working with other people. And mm, that's I mean, absolutely true. It always ends up all this drama comes up and, you know, people always talk about too, like what we need for resistance is community. And that's not true. It's be just because the community is not going to come together. We don't know how to be in community. And I really believe now through experience and through what, everything I've done that we need resistance. And however we can get the community of resistance together is fine. But to expect this community where people aren't going to have these weird like issues that crop up because we're also damaged from this culture of narcissism. Oh, we totally um, are. Is, is I know I am. Far before, yeah. I mean, communities will happen if we can survive the collapse because then nobody has a choice to be mad at you and walk away. You know what I, and, and that's kind of sad because, you know, by then, you know, it would, it will be too late to stop, you know, or to do what, I, I guess it's not sad. It, it would be a good thing if we were all forced into having community. It's just sad that we can't form that community to resist and to really come together before that happens. But I mean, the more I think about it, in a rational and experienced way, I think that the only reason community is going to happen or way it will happen is if it is, if this overarching system is gone, because right now somebody gets mad at you, they don't have to talk to you. They can just, and that happens a lot, like in activism, like somebody gets mad, they hate you, they go off, they never talk with you again, you know, and, and if I know. What is a system of domination. I, I've been through that a billion times with, with, um, volunteers and stuff i mean people are so into themselves they can't see the whole picture and for some reason they they make everything they do about them like they're not getting enough credit for this they're you know this didn't happen the way they thought it should happen and, and it just ruins the whole the whole idea of it and i wish i could have done more environmental activism i like you've done, like, I am so jealous of the things that you've done. I would have, I, the biggest thing I did as far as trying to protect animals was I, I refused to dissect in high school biology class. Absolutely refused because I thought it was ridiculous to kill all those animals for, for something. We're not learning anything because you can learn it in a textbook and maybe, you know, have one that you take the test on. And I had a friend that joined me and we took the the test. Everybody else had to do the dissection and, and learn it with the actual dead frog. Me and my friend, we, we just learned it from a book and, and still had to take the test on the real frog. We we both got the highest scores in the class. So there's no reason to, to, to raise and kill all those frogs for that particular purpose. You know, that's the biggest animal activism I've done. <laughs> And that's, I mean, that you could recognize it at that age too, because a lot of kids just do what they're told. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, but I mean, the whole idea of science and the idea that, you know, the goal of science is really to make matter and energy jump through hoops on command, as Derek Jensen has talked about before. And um, it's just skewed from the start that you would take any living being and cut it into pieces so that you can gain knowledge and, and like, like, I like how Derek says the thing too, you know, if he takes, if I, if you and I met and I held a gun to your hand, head and I said, Hey, you're going to jump through this hoop when I tell you to, uh, you know, and if you don't, I've got this gun and you're going to say, I'm going to jump through that hoop when she tells me to, but now you and I have lost all, uh, all ability to ever have a relationship with each other. I've destroyed that, that, you know, 
thing. And that's the same thing that science does. It really says, you know, we're going to find out this information by destroying everything. I mean, I, it drives me nuts doing like all these articles where they talk about, you know, you shouldn't destroy all the rainforest or do anything like that because there's medicine that might cure us of diseases. And I always think that just drives me bonkers, like in terms that what, all of our justifications for saving- Are for human use. Are, like yes. It's like, you know, humans really, I think, you know, the vaccines, the viruses and all that, that, that we fought back so hard on are the earth's system and intelligence trying to keep our, our population where it should be on this planet. I mean, that's part of one of the main- I know. Oh, oh God, you touched on something. I really want to spend a whole show talking about. Yeah. Let's, let's just save that one because that's okay. going to be really controversial, but I yeah. really want to go- into great detail on that very topic. Yeah. Let's it's save not, that because we got to talk to our people and we have to end exactly, exactly yeah. at eight. So, but damn, I want to go, we have to schedule a new, another show really soon because just that topic, I am so excited to, to go into that one. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. We're again. probably going to piss off a lot of people, though. Yeah. Just well, it's really hard when you're seeing with civilization, saying civilization needs to be dismantled. I mean, people, that is a really hard thing to say because the reality of that is extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. And it's going to be awful. The, the, it already is for most people on this planet. And, but when it comes to us, it's going to be terrible. And we're not, you know, but, but. Yeah. If you take, it, it's just the difference between taking a very individualized perspective on things or, or a world perspective, a broad perspective yeah. on happening on the on entire things. planet. And, and okay. emotionally, you know, we never want to see anybody we love hurt. No, of course we don't. Of course and we don't. Know, I don't want to be in pain if there's technology to fix me. That's a, a very individual le level. Yeah. So controversial. Exactly. I mean, God, I want to, I could talk to you for freaking ever, but I know we could, I want to get through a lot of the comments and have other people have a chance to, to talk to you as well. So first I'm just going to say hi. If there's, oh, there's already a question. So I'm going to say hi to, to Sandy from Environmental Coffee House. As Shiva. Awesome. Thank you. You're always here. I love you, As Shiva. Val, thank you. Um, oh, man. Uh, let's see. <laughs> These guys are so awesome. Yeah, of course, I think awesome. all the time. I think the one thing, like what you, so the question, you want to read the question? Oh, did you? Can you see the comments? I can see the question. Okay, go ahead, ask it. If, or do you want me to read it and you answer it? Okay, Deanna, how many years until you think it is before things will get to a panic mode in the US, USA, and other developed countries? <clears throat> well, I think we're kind of there. <laughs> um, I don't think, you know, but, but I think we've got this amazing power of our minds to trick ourselves into believing that things aren't really happening when they are. Um, if you mean like how long it's going to take before food is on the shelves, because see, the thing is we can, that's when people will wake up is when there's yeah, no water like, in the tap and no food in China. We can ignore these rapid like rises and plummets in the stock market. We can ignore the anger that, that everybody's like all the hatred and everything that's been inspired and harnessed by the Trump team. We can right. ignore like the way our school systems are completely falling apart. My son's in school right now and it's terrible, like the services that they have now. And we're in one of the more, you know, better off, better well-to-do counties in Colorado. And it's a nightmare what's going on in there. Uh, social people trying to get help through social services all the way across the board, it's falling. So, I mean, that that's kind of there. I could not predict and I won't, you know, when the food's going to stop, when the comfort stop is when the chaos is really going to happen in the developed countries. So when people aren't able to procure food or aren't able to get their heat or aren't able to have their social media, that's when things are probably going to get pretty rough for us. And we're going to have to come face to face with what actually we're probably in the middle of. How yeah, long or one of those disasters, like the, yeah. the flooding in the Midwest, that's mm -hmm. insane. Like okay. when, once that hits yeah. you. All of that, yeah. And we Especially for a second time or a third time, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and people just put the blinders on. I mean. I know. They do. They yeah. do. And we have the, we are, human beings have, uh, our brains are that way where we can really, really comfort ourselves through our own delusions. And right. it doesn't become apparent till that last tree's chopped, you know, like, like with Easter Island or whatever. You know, <laughs> so we're personally affected and we don't have food to put in our stomach. Exactly. Okay. As Shiva says, the media is hiding what's really happening from people who are not looking. 
And, and that's true. They are. They're holding back so much of, of the truth. They're, they're just not, not out there um, putting forth all the information. And when they do, it's just a little, they skip over it. Like, it's like, oh, this is happening. Oh, let's go on to, you know, the royal couple's baby name. You know, I mean, they spend so much time on such trivial BS. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't, I just don't get how they do that. Well, the reason it works so well is, and, and thank God for people like you and for people, we do have social media where people who are able to think, which are few and far between. And there's a lot of reasons for that besides just our culture. Like if you look at carbon and what's happening there and how that affects the way our brain works, that's another interesting topic. But oh, I mean, yeah people can buy into the media to that that extent is just because we've been trained from birth on and in school to never question figures of authority and to just take in that that news and kids especially now too and i'm not saying all of them for sure there's always a good group but the people buy what they hear on the media and they're entertained by it and they're too like their brain they don't have to practice common sense we don't, I mean, there's nothing yeah. in our lives that practice common sense. We don't have to practice critical thinking and we are losing our ability to have long form thinking. So, you know, when I was a kid, we had to remember telephone numbers. Nobody remembers telephone numbers. Now they've got the computer. When we I were know, I, re I remembered my bank account number, my social security mm -hmm. account, um, my social security number, my, my driver's license number. I don't know anyone who knows their driver's license number anymore. Like who mem remembers that? I know it off the top of my hand. I used to know all of that stuff. Yeah. I still know my checking account number. I still know my driver's license number. Of course, I still know my social security number. I, I still have several phone numbers that I don't have programmed in my phone that I just remember. Um, but that's few and far between nowadays. But, oh, we have a question. Gazar, Gazar, when are you going to be in charge of the Mars colony? <laughs> that's so funny to even think that we could ever go to mars i mean it's just that that whole idea about mars well we could probably go to mars but colonizing it is that. Totally I mean, we can't even make a biosphere in new mexico that could support humans for a while that was a huge failure i know they have a fake mars um thing out here in utah yeah, like a, a, yeah where they're trying to like simulate it but they'll never be able to grow food there what what oz is waving is it yeah, just really quick on the topic about going to Mars. Yeah, yeah. All these smart, intelligent people at NASA, don't they realize what the hell's going on with the planet and why do they continue to pump Mars? <laughs> I don't know. Do I, don't get, I don't get that. Why, Oz? <laughs> I don't yeah. get it either. Yeah, I mean, you know, paycheck. And, yeah. and I don't know, or do they know? I ask myself that a lot too. Like, are they all these people in charge? You know, is it just that those who with the most choice wins? Is that an element of it? I think that that is totally that with the with the wealthy. They're they're just trying to get as much as they can before they die. But let's get through as many of these as possible because we have. Okay, we have a few minutes, but I like and I like in getting the people, you know involved okay val says i heard on npr today they said it was going to be normal hurricane season but then they acted like their hair was on fire saying prepare now i i think it's going to be a little bit more than a normal <laughs> season <clears throat> um let's see bio hey bio thanks for coming don't forget to come tomorrow when paul's going to be here um prince william thinks everyone else should give up the third kid just not <laughs> okay bio you're hilarious our people are funny um gazar gazar <laughs> oh wait how big is your fridge in cubic meters or cubic feet <laughs> my people are so weird <laughs> is that like a storage question like i don't know i guess i don't know <gasps> Yeah, I mean, of course, you wouldn't have refrigerators, and guess what? Our ancestors didn't have refrigerators. I know. I'm thinking of, of digging a, a, a cold storage. Like you have to dig it really deep here because it's so we're in desert, so high desert, but we're still in desert. I think we're gonna really need to dig a cold storage and a well, for sure. Um, it was a jest about Mars. <laughs> okay. Gazar Gazar says it was a jest about Mars. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Oh, uh, shoot. What did I miss about Brian? What did Brian say? Hi, Kent. Who did I miss? Hi, Torstein. John Kelly. Hi. John Kelly says five to 10 years before panic time. I mean, I hope we have that long, honestly. What do you think? I think, you know, I mean, I don't think there's any point in putting it down. It, it could happen tomorrow. I mean, it's like, you know, yeah. I, I feel honestly from sitting on the land and from doing those listening exercises, it's, it's hard to tell like which, if it's just my feelings interrupting it or my thought pro process because I'm overly hyper. <laughs> I think about too much. I but, know. I do too. I do too. I think about the water supply and the point, you know, the poison of the yeah. poison of the water. I feel, I feel fear from the land and I feel like we're close. Yeah. I and and you know and I know we're probably close. Now how close is that? Who knows? Yeah. 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 I'm not gonna venture a guess, but I know it's close. Uh, yeah. I mean once the economy starts going, that's one thing that could cause, you know, cascading systems failure maybe you know there's there's multiple things the the climate could cause that economy to go to cause that i mean so who knows all we know is that you know it's kind of like we're in trouble and until these psychopaths or sociopaths that are running the system are stopped you know which isn't going to happen because the system's rigged okay brian so i gotta read a couple more comments brian says this is a great combo those some truths we all need to contemplate. Thank you for having the combo, ladies. Thank you, Brian, for being here. I, too bad your link didn't work. He was going to jump on with us, but oh. the link didn't work for him. I don't know why, and I didn't, we didn't have time to figure it out beforehand. Um, Val, I try to go vegan, but sometimes I can't find vegan food when I am out. <laughs> And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's another conversation for another time, but yeah, um, it totally is. Let's not go there. Cause Brian will get all over it. Cause Brian yeah. is vegan and he thinks that will save the world. And I would like to think there was something that was that simple that would save the world. Um, I'm not convinced. Um, I don't think anything can save the world at, at all right now, but we could at least slow it down. And I think the biggest thing is just being local because shipping in food, I don't care how vegan you are. If you're shipping in food from another country, you're using all the fossil fuels to get it here. So yeah, agriculture too. And then, in yeah. And growing it. So if you're growing it yourself without fossil fuels that, and, and I know Brian has, a, he's making his lawn a garden. So I have big, huge kudos for him for doing that. So, and he's doing a nice job doing a raised bed garden instead of a lawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah bam, that's the way to go. And I'm, I'm slowly getting my husband into doing that. We're starting to fill in our lawn with garden beds instead because <laughs> I want food outside my door. That's always, that's, that's good. I don't know that. I don't think it'll make any difference on the, the system. Well, for me, it will. For yeah. my family, it will. <laughs> that's, and I try to live off the land as much as I can for my own brain. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it feels good to get your hands in the dirt and, and to eat the food after you grow it. There's nothing more satisfying than that. Yeah. Okay. We have nine minutes left. Um, I said hello to Sandy. Um, let's see. Just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Of course I said hello to Ken Deal, I believe. I hope so. Um, Val. Always awesome. Uh, let's see. I always inevitably when I go back through the replay and miss people. Oh, Trev B five. Hey, Trev. Hey, I gave you that wrench for a reason, not uh, more so you can get rid of the trolls that you don't like. <laughs> and so you, he he always posts um really good links, but they always I I block links from my my comments and stuff because oh. I always get the climate deniers posting the same old thing about how the solar thing is more important than anything and humans don't matter and carbon is good all those stupid links so i'm just done okay yeah. <laughs> so so i've had to release all trev's links that he's posted and, and i'm just tired of going through them and i miss them a lot and then they don't get posted so anyway i made him him a a, a ranch so he could help me let's see there's val and just post him himself and not have to release them Use, okay, I think I got through everybody who's commenting anyway. That doesn't mean that's all who's on the the stream, but that's just who's commenting. So cool. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. We have seven more minutes. So go crazy on what topic? 
Well, what, what, what would you like to explore a little bit more? Oh, wait, I guess there's a comment here that I missed. <laughs> Density McCartney. Um, Jim Hightower has a real eye-opener this month of the devastation of farm country is biting us all in the butt. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear more about what he means. I mean, the, you know, I mean, what we've done to our soil through yeah monoculture culture and the green revolution and all the yeah cool and chemical fertilizers that are going into the water causing algae blooms and and yeah. all that so yeah I, I that's why i don't think just being vegan is is good enough because you, you for one you have to be completely you have to to just break up the farms and and do it more naturally maybe permaculture a little bit i mean Hell, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I just know we got to do it different than we're doing it now. Yeah, permaculture is, is a good way. I mean, the, the the issue is we have so much food that we're making and population always matches food supply. Oh, Trent Black, shut up. Hi, Trent. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so that's that's just, you know, that's, I was looking at this Paul Stamets question here, but I'm, you know, I mean, that that's just, uh, it, so going vegan is just creating all those crops that your soy is grown on used to be prairie communities of prairie dogs and whatever else in a huge biodiverse place. So mm -hmm. like I said before, I mean, the real key in, in learning how to maybe think better and be more connected and get some real guidance from, from the beings who've been here much longer than humans would be to really try to connect with your local land base and try to learn how to live off of what you can grow yourself or what you can hunt yourself or whatever, however way you can survive in your local community, in your local economy. Yeah, localized. Not, that's what I've on created. somebody else who's building it, going to Walmart and buying all vegan stuff or your local store. It's kind of, the, the, I think it's dangerous because it gives people the impression that if I'm a vegan and only eat that, then I have done my job and I don't have to fight the system. That's, I, I don't care what anybody eats or does. What I care about is, are we? Can we figure out how to come together and try to resist what's happening? And and so those individual choices, like if I just don't buy toilet paper, you're just going to probably smell. But I mean that it's going to actually stop the rainforest destruction. Or if I only use fluorescent lights, which is you know what we used to say, and on and on, those things don't do a bit of, they don't do anything to change the structure and the system and the grinding down of our biosphere. Yeah, I I agree. The, the biggest thing is we just have too many people. Yeah. I mean, there are so many solutions we could actually do, but we just need less people because there's no solution at the, this point with as many people that would actually work. Right. And and that's the problem I have that, that I keep running into. Hi, Bill Wonder. Cows eat way more soy than people. Yeah, that's probably very true. That's yeah, why you shouldn't, shouldn't eat from industrial. Yeah, no more industrial agriculture. The confined oh, animals, geez, it's all a nightmare. It's all just, and you're eating the pure fear and poison of those <laughs> orchard. I mean, on and on. It's a whole, the whole industrialized scale form of it's food just, production is it's a god awful. Problem. Yeah, it's a problem. I mean, all the way across. Trent's uh, gonna steal food from all of us, so. <laughs> Oh, wait, I was just going to read one, but okay. Go ahead. <laughs> come up, but it just went away then. We have three minutes, so we got to get out of here because poor Oz has a meeting. Right I just saw one briefly about Paul Stamets, and I'm a big fan of Paul Stamets. Oh, okay. I mean, and did you miss it? Will you I, find that, Oz? Oz can probably find it. It takes land to produce yes, animals and animals if it's not feeding 70 billion. This is something about the collapse ha ha helping biotic communities and I do. Okay, Oz will find that. Let me just read Brian's really quick because it's right here. It takes less land to produce plants than animals. If we stop feeding 70 billion animals per year, I think we will make a significant dent. Um, yeah, I, we're going to have, me and Brian are going to have kind of a debate on, on that. And I think anytime you're, you're industrial agriculture in any form, whether it be for plants or animals, I think you're, there's a problem there. So we have to debate that in, in you know, I, I am all for veganism. I'm all for people who don't eat animals. So I, I'm just, 
what do you think? <laughs> well, for anything that would work, the thing is, like, if we produce, like you said, I mean, is it going to stop the collapsing of biodiversity when everybody else on the planet wants that meat? I mean, it, mm -hmm. like, so I, there's a lot in the United States, there's a lot of more leaning towards eating different food, vegetables, which is arguably not good for you. I mean, there's a lot of people saying that, and, and I agree with that too, but I mean, the, if it made a big difference for biotic communities, I would be for that too. I question the fact that, I mean, has meat production gone down since people have started eating it on the overall scale? And the answer to that is no, that it's actually gone up. And that's because population is going up because if we don't eat it, somebody else wants it. And so, you know, I mean, the system itself needs to be dismantled. Yeah. And how do you do that? That's a whole other conversation. God, we got to be on again, like maybe next week. Like, seriously, I would have you on on a weekly basis if I could. Okay, last comment, because we are 7.59. We have less than a minute, and, and Oz has got to get out of here to go to his meeting. So yes. last last comment, unless you find that Paul one that she was talking about. Um, do you agree that climate collapse can be a solution to biodiversity loss? That's, that's a tough one. I mean, right now, the biodiversity loss is extraordinary and climate collapse is going to create much more loss because of the changes in, because of the client. I mean, right now we're in the middle of the mass, six, the mass six extinction. It's going to get worse and worse and worse in the long run. I, 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 I hope, I mean, I, I think I, civilization collapsing will be the biggest thing that can help. <laughs> you know? Right, and that's going to have huge repercussions on it. But, but in the long run, that's what the hope would be: that more life, the less that life is taken and is here to go back into the soil. I don't think life will ever be the same on this planet after after us, after the industrial civilization. We've done a lot of damage for every yes, action. There's yeah. an opposite and equal reaction, and that's going to happen. So, you know, I'm scared for it all. I think that the more that's left as we go down, the better the chance the earth is going to have to heal what the loss that has occurred because of our insane behaviors. Yeah. So maybe it'll take millions of years to, to re, you know, to help restore if there's something left and maybe nothing will be restored if we continue to go and push the earth towards a Venus atmosphere. That's exactly what I worry about. Okay. Gazar, Gazar, I already know I've had, you, you tell me glitchy sounds. I'm sorry. I don't know what the problem is with that. Do, do I sound okay to you, Deanna? You uh, sound really good. I wonder if it's my connection. Maybe it's just me. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm sure they'll tell me when I review this, but we've got to get out of here for um, Oz. Um, good night, guys. Okay. Thank you. I don't think I've, I, hopefully I said hello to everybody. I, Anita made it. Anthony Davis made it. Oh my gosh. I guess so. You guys are late, but we're just getting ready to leave. So you're going to have to watch the replay because Oz has to go to another meeting and I am already one minute past. Okay, guys, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Deanna. I definitely have to have you on again. I would do it I next week it. if you'll let me uh, because I want to talk about that one thing <laughs> about the vac vaccinations and other things yeah. And, yeah. and stuff like that because that probably will get me kicked off of YouTube, but I want to talk about it. So, <laughs> you know, it's a hard topic to talk about, but yeah, it, it really yeah. is. And, and I'll probably make a lot of people mad, but I have just a different opinion than most people have. So, um, I don't know. And, and it has nothing to do with the science of it or whatever, you know, well, kind of, but not really, not, not really. Anyway, yeah. <sighs> I don't negate the science. There's just other issues. Oh well, yeah. Human over other is an issue. Yes. Okay. So right thank now, you. And, and, and you know we're not going to turn on each other because of that. But I mean, I think it's something we can acknowledge. Like you know, the Earth is pretty smart, and we keep trying to fight her. Yeah, we could keep trying to outsmart the planet, yeah. and I think it's backfiring big time. So. Yeah, I agree. <sighs> okay. Well, I hate to go, but Oz has another meeting. I'm not his only one. He he cheats on me regularly. So. <laughs> <laughs> is what it is. Um, I appreciate it, and I look forward to talking to you next time. Okay, you can stand by for just one second, and we'll just run our little goodbye intro. Bye, guys. Love y'all, and we'll see you tomorrow with Paul. Um, I think it's at the same time. Yeah, seven seven p.m. Um, Mountain Time. 
and it'll be 9 p.m. his time um, Eastern. So hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. Have a good night.